Hey guys, I'm Greta Kate. I'm a stay-at-home mom living in a small town in the heart of Wisconsin. I usually have a lot to say, so I'm glad you're here to listen. Grab a latte and a cozy blanket and let's chat. This is the Greta Kate Homebody Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Graticate Homebody Podcast. Today, as promised, I will be diving deeper into the declutter roadmap that I briefly chatted about in episode 13. This morning, I'm drinking a cinnamon dolce latte from Starbucks. So thank you so much to Kayla, Jessica, and Anna for supporting the podcast this week. If you'd like to support the show and get a shout out on the podcast, you can do so by making a donation at buymeacoffee.com slash Homebody. So we touched on declutter road mapping in episode 13, where I chatted about falling in love with your home again and how clutter tends to be the trigger that sets us off when it comes to being frustrated with our home or apartment or wherever you're currently living. But in case you didn't catch that episode or you just need a little recap, I'm going to just first chat about clutter and what road mapping is and how to get started. As a side note, I'm expecting my declutter road mapping guide to be done before the end of the month, so I'll keep you posted on that. So as I mentioned a few times now, clutter is a tough mountain to tackle, but a super necessary one because everything in your home takes up physical and mental space. And in the realm of mental space, clutter is processed in your brain as unmade decisions. And the more unmade decisions you have, the more easily stressed out and overwhelmed you become, right? So tackling clutter and managing what's left into organized areas is really important for our mental and physical health. I don't know about you, but I can just watch one episode of Hoarders and I will be deep cleaning and organizing everything by the end of the day. The last time I watched an episode of Hoarders, I pulled all the furniture out from the walls of my bedroom, rearranged everything, decluttered. It was a disaster all day, but it looks so good now. Unfortunately for most, decluttering never happens because of lack of time or better yet, lack of priority. And then it gets so out of control that there's no will to start and no idea how to even start. Fortunately for you, if you're listening to this podcast or interested in decluttering, you're already on the first step on your way to decluttering and living freely because you're making the decision to work on the problem. I know someone who I used to think had minor hoarding tendencies She had a shopping addiction and a lack of cleaning priority in her life. And it was really hard to watch. And just being in her home honestly made me so anxious. I would try to help organize and clean up when I was there, but it was chaotic and she wasn't willing to help with the process. She was in that home for, I think it was like eight years. And I remember when she moved out and into her current home, I was just in shock with how many trailers of garbage and items that she no longer wanted that she took to the dump. It kind of made me sad because she also has children and it took her moving to actually make that effort to create a clutter-free environment for her family. Unfortunately, we are almost six years into being into her new home now. And while there's the typical clutter from daily life around her home, she's now used her basement, which she didn't have in her previous home, as a breeding ground for clutter. And it's really discouraging to see. I've offered so many times to come and help her with no avail. All that to say that your willingness to take control of your own clutter at home is the most important first step. So I'm developing my decluttering roadmap right now so you can easily go room to room, drawer by drawer, cabinet by cabinet, and tackle clutter successfully and efficiently. The way I tackle decluttering is a more gentle approach than what you might see on organizing shows like Marie Kondo where she has you dump everything out and makes you confront it all at once. I do like that it allows you to see how much excess you actually have, but unless you're going to spend your entire weekend decluttering one room, this really just isn't the most efficient way in my opinion, and I think it could cause additional overwhelm. I believe in a simpler, more manageable approach, and I actually just learned about and have been reading about Swedish death cleaning, which actually sounds super intense and scary, But it's actually very easy and gentle, and the process expects you to take your time, work in small increments, and not be constrained by time or checklists. While Swedish death cleaning is slow, it's done intentionally and thoughtfully over time. Death is inevitable, you guys, right? Not trying to get you down or anything, but the motivation behind this practice of cleaning and decluttering is looking ahead when you die. You're going to be leaving all your possessions behind, right? 
And I guarantee that while you love your stuff, it's mostly stuff that your loved ones are not going to want or need, and they'll be carrying the burden of dealing with your stuff after you're gone. I realize this probably sounds a little ridiculous to think about death, but I'm in my mid-30s, and while I know tomorrow's not guaranteed, I could possibly be living for another 60 years. My grandfather just passed away last week. He was 97, and my grandmother, who's 96, is still alive. Going through your loved one's homes after they pass is heart-wrenching enough without the additional stress of having to deal with decades worth of clutter. So decluttering is not just something you're doing for yourself for minimal living and peace. It's done out of respect and love and kindness for your children and your friends and your family that you'll leave behind when you're gone. I'm positive that I'll gain and lose possessions in the years to come, but I definitely don't want those possessions to be burdensome on me in life. And I sure do not want those possessions to be burdensome on my children when I'm gone. Swedish death cleaning is geared more towards, well, I'd like to say like retirement age when you've gone beyond middle age and you're like arriving in your golden age. But I don't know about you, but when I retire, I want to retire. I don't want to have to spend every day cleaning and organizing. I'm going to want to travel, spend time with my grandchildren, paint and garden. So That's kind of why I encourage the process to begin sooner than later because you can manage it throughout your life then. And then you'll also have the tools later in life to be able to tackle any decluttering without the stress. Okay, so let's move on to declutter mapping. So you can use what you may have just learned about death cleaning and start your journey now. Declutter road mapping is fairly simple but necessary for planning your declutter journey. It'll help guide you through the process so you know where you're going next and you can gain momentum in the process. And like I said, I'm working on a declutter roadmap guide right now for you guys, and I'm hoping to have it done by the end of the month. But the roadmap will basically look like this. The first, you're going to write down all the rooms and areas in your house. So like a linen closet or a drop zone is an area versus like your kitchen and bathroom, which are obviously rooms. So you'll write all of those down. And then you're going to make like a spider graph under each room and you're going to write all the areas where there's stuff. So if you're looking at like your bathroom, for example, under the bathroom, you'll have like your vanity countertop, drawer one, drawer two, drawer three, et cetera, shelf above the toilet. You get the picture, right? So everywhere where there's stuff, including like even the shower, you can put that in there in case you need to declutter your shower. And then you're going to highlight the easiest space to declutter in one color. I like to use yellow and the hardest space to declutter in another, which I usually do pink. From there, you'll label each area, starting with the easiest being your yellow highlighted area as number one. And then you're going to rank them all through the hardest area to declutter. This process might take a little while in and of itself. And you can literally compartmentalize the areas you need to declutter as small as you like. For example, like, My coat closet is in our front hall. I could just write coat closet as a part of the living room, um, like an area to declutter in my living room, or I can designate it as its own area and then compartmentalize inside the closet as hanging items, hat bin, glove bin, Greta shoe bin, Brady shoe bin, and then make it a five-step process versus a one-step process. Whatever is going to work best for your time and your sanity, that is what you should do. So once you have all your areas and your rooms charted out and decluttering areas, the next step is to figure out which rooms will be the easiest versus the hardest to declutter. You can see that process easily in your charts with how many branches per room while you're making your charts and walking around your house. You can also note or star areas that you think will take more time and be the most overwhelming. And once you have all that figured out, you'll do the same thing we did for each room and you'll order the rooms easiest to hardest, and that will be the path you take in decluttering. So if your dining room will be the easiest to declutter, you'll start in the dining room, and then you'll look at the branches on your chart and move from easiest to hardest, the ones that you wrote down. If you follow this method, you are sure to gain momentum and be motivated to continue on your journey. Just a couple of side notes. I always like to mention this. Save sentimental items for last, photos, love letters, that kind of thing. Any sentimental things, don't dwell on it. If you can't part with it for whatever reason and you're emotionally attached to it, have a box and just toss all that stuff in a box. And then you can tackle it little by little after the entire house is done. The other note is to take pictures. Every time you declutter anything, 
So if you're working on your top dresser drawer today, then take a picture of the before, take a picture when you're done, whether it's today or tomorrow, and then keep all those pictures handy so you can admire your work. Don't just let them sit on your phone. I like to actually have them visually available to me and it'll just keep you motivated. So that is kind of the overall vision of declutter road mapping. I know you guys, I'm a visual learner. So having someone just tell me kind of this stuff is a little bit more difficult than seeing it on a piece of paper. So I'll work as hard as I can in the next week or so to get that roadmap guide ready for you. In the meantime, if you have questions, you can always contact me. I'm more than happy to answer them, more than happy to help you get going on your journey. I know you can do this. It'll take a little time and effort, but it is totally worth it for your sanity. And like I said, for your loved one's peace now and after you pass. So next week, I haven't really decided what I want to talk about yet. I was thinking maybe we'll chat about February Huga, but I've also been wanting to do like a favorite things episode for homebodies. So I guess you'll just have to come back next week and find out. As always, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. If you're interested in checking out my shop or subscribing to our weekly email so we can stay in touch, you can visit forestmer.com. See you next week.